This last week, I'm guessing that most of you had an opportunity to be with your family. I certainly did. We do a whole lot of sitting around the, the table and laughing and telling stories. Uh, if, if I were around my siblings as I was yesterday, we had a wedding shower for Andrew and Carissa yesterday with all of my siblings and my, my mom and, and uh, all the cousins. Anytime you're, we're sitting around, somehow certain stories will show up. Uh, my brother will probably tell, or I will tell the story of my twin brother being so upset at me whenever we were 12 years old or so, and, and he was chasing me around the house while my parents were gone, and I was able to get into my room at the very last moment and lock the door so he wouldn't beat me up, and he was so mad, he just hit the door and he made a big hole in the bedroom door. He would tell that story, or I would, and as soon as I would tell that story, he would say, well... At least I didn't burn the back field down because I was playing with fire like you. And then somebody else would, would tell the story, well, did anybody remember whenever Brent was playing baseball at age nine and somebody swung a bat and hit him in the chin and knocked him out and, and our dad jumped from the, uh, where they were sitting over the, the linked fence and ripped his pants in front of everybody and we'd all laugh, right? It, these are the stories that, show up almost every time that we all get together. Darla's family, one of, the, one of the things that I loved about going to Darla's mom and dad's house to do was to not just eat lunch after church on Sunday, but they would normally invite some friends over from church and we would eat lunch and then we would sit at the table and nibble at whatever was left and tell stories until it was supper time. And then mom would say, well, let's get supper out. We were still at the table telling stories. And somehow a story would go from here to there, and a, another story would come out, and it would probably be the story of me trying to be romantic with Darla on one of our very first dates, sitting in front of her parents' parsonage, and we were sitting in the, on the sidewalk at night enjoying a beautiful full moon, moon, and I was feeling romantic and digging deep down in my soft romantic side. I said, Darla, the moon reminds me of you. It's so big and round. <laughs> She's never let me live that one down. Yeah. <laughs> Remembering is a powerful tool of worship as well, isn't it? Many of us can paint the scene of the day that we accepted Christ. I can tell you that the altars at my church went all the way across. And they, the altars were uh, built into the platform. And this spot right here was where I would come to the altar. My parents sat right there, and I'd come down this aisle. This was my reserve spot. This is where I accepted Christ as my personal Savior 18 times. <laughs> Mostly right after the last service of the revival, right? Greens, you all remember that, Grammy? You remember the, the big altar service the last Sunday of the revival? So that, that was my reserve spot. I can remember that. We can see vividly the, the face of the neighbor who wept with us as she explained the gospel to us for the very first time. We can remember when the Lord came on us in a dramatic way this last year, right? When we learn something new, when our children begin to learn and grow and mature in the faith and ask questions that helped us to realize they were getting it finally. Just hours before Jesus' arrest, he invited his disciples to remember with him. So in honor of God's word being read, could I invite you to stand? And I'm going to read to you Luke chapter 22, 14 through 20. And I want you to understand, my friends, what I'm about to read to you 
is God's word. It's life changing. It's without error and it will not change. Listen to God's word. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink it again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, The cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Let me stop right there. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Remembering has always been a vital exercise of God's people as a part of of their worship. In the Old Testament, the Israelites were encouraged by God to build altars out of stone and remember. That was part of their worship experience. They were to remember that a great event occurred right here in this spot. You might remember when the Israelites finally got done wandering in the wilderness and entered the promised land, they built an altar after they had crossed the Jordan River into the promised land. Do you remember that? God said to Joshua in the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones, listen, these stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. Joshua chapter 4. At times, these stones were called stones of remembrance. Now, that might be a bit odd in the Old Testament culture and context, but I think you know we use stones even today as stones of remembrance. What, what, what stone is the most significant that we do often Anybody walked through a cemetery recently? What are those stones all about? They are to give honor to a person. A person who had a history. A person who had a birth date and had a death date. A person that lived life in between those years. And any time we walk through that cemetery, whether it's in a year in it or in 30 years, I had the privilege of walking uh, in the cemetery finding my great, 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 great grandfather and grandmother in Lexington, Kentucky last summer. Hundreds of years ago, and I was able to remember and celebrate that they were holiness pastors. On their cemetery stone, it said, holiness unto the Lord. What, what, a, what a privilege to be a pastor and looking at someone who'd gone before me and remembering. We use stones sometimes to put at the corner of a building, right? We put the date when that building was built and maybe a name of somebody who donated enough money to build that church or that college building and it's called now the, the whatever building and it's a stone of remembrance. That's what they were doing in the Old Testament as well. The stone altars <clears throat> were to help them remember, one of the things was to help them remember the covenants that God had made with them, promises that God had committed to them that would never be broken. And the most significant was the covenant that God made for Abraham, that, that the Messiah would come from his lineage, that there was a promised land 
for the people that came out of his lineage. Genesis, Genesis 12, 7, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your offspring, I will give this land, Israel. So he built Abraham. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. The stone altars were to help them retell the stories of their children every time they would pass by. In fact, parents would purposely pass by these altars or when people were moving from one area to another, they would go by this altar. And the children would say, what is that all about, Dad? And the dad would gather all the children. And he'd begin to repeat the story. He would tell the story of the covenant that God had made with Abraham. Therefore, for them as well and for their future lineage. The most solemn remembrance to the Jews was also during the Passover feast. You all know the story. It's found in Exodus chapter 12. The Israelites were held captive in Egypt. God was working out their escape. And the story we find in Exodus chapter 12 says this. On, the night, on that same night I will pass through Egypt, God says, and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. This is why... This was called the Passover meal because God passed over them. God passed over the Jews and saved them from death. So let me explain a little bit more about the Passover feast. Every year since this escape from Egypt, Jews around the world celebrated the exact same way they still celebrate it today. Every, May, every year a a male a goat, a sheep, or a cow without blemish would be chosen. It would be, it would be slaughtered between actual sunset and complete darkness. A, a, a limb, several limbs of what we call the hyssop uh, a bush would be then dipped into the blood of the animal and then smeared on the doorposts of the lintel of the house where the meal was being held. It's not being celebrated exactly that today, but it certainly was in the Old Testament and even during Jesus' time. After the blood was smeared on the lintel of the front door, the, uh, the whole animal would be roasted without breaking any bone, and it would be eaten by all of the family members as well as strangers that had been invited in, and even the slaves would participate it was eaten that same night with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Each one of those meant something specific. It gave an opportunity for the priest or the father of the home to explain what had gone on during that original Passover. All who partook would have their, all of their clothes on as if they were taking a long journey, just, just like the Israelites who were about to escape. They would wear their clothing. They would have their sandals on their feet. They would have their staff in their hands, ready to march out of Egypt. The unleavened bread would symbolize the spiritual purity after which Israel in covenant with the Lord was to strive for. The bitter herbs were intended to call to mind the bitter experiences which the Israelites had suffered with in Egypt. It was all about, the whole Passover meal was all about remembering what God had done for them that night that he passed over them. Remembering has always been a big part of our church discipline and journey, hasn't it? 
during this time of the Passover meal, they remembered. They remembered that they were the beneficiaries of God's liberating power. They remembered that it took an all-powerful God to protect them from certain death and liberate them from enslavement. They remembered that it took an all-knowing God to know the mind of an evil Pharaoh. They remembered that it took a sovereign God to be in control even when the situation looked hopeless. But they also remembered that their liberation was costly. Thousands of lives were taken to buy their freedom. The firstborn sons and firstborn animals of the Egyptians were killed that night. So they remembered that their liberation was costly. Let me ask you, as we have finished another year, what do you remember that brings God honor? We each have personal spiritual praises to remember, don't we? For some in our congregation, there was a healing. Some of you have told me how you recognize that God had healed your body or healed a relationship. And we, celebrate, we celebrated with you this last year. Perhaps some of you, there was a financial blessing that God provided a resource that, that you didn't expect. You had no way to provide for yourself, but somehow God provided a financial blessing. For some of you, you have spiritual stories, stories of how God blessed you with an understanding of the Scripture. Some of you learned how to study the Bible this last year just a little bit better. Some of you wrapped your arms around certain passages and you finally had some aha moments that will change the way that you see God even this next year. For some of you, it could have been addictions that was broken this last year. And we celebrate with you. These are opportunities for us to, to worship and remember and celebrate as we look at the last year. We remember what God did in and through our church as well. There are new believers in our sanctuary today because this last year our church was generous to provide funds, had leadership, had, had ministries where these begin to wrestle with their spiritual challenges and they found answers and we celebrate that. So we have new believers in our congregation, in our church. We have new friends, don't we? There are some friends that I have sitting in this congregation this very moment that I didn't even know a year ago. And can I tell you, next January 1, I will say the same thing. There will be some people coming in these next 52 weeks that I have not met yet and you haven't either, and they will become my good friends and yours too. And we will become a family, and I look forward to that. Some of us this next year will make some spiritual steps of faith. There are some of you who have not yet made a commitment to follow Christ with your whole heart. You've been asking questions. We've been praying for you. You have been, you've been faithful to come and asking questions. I have faith that this year, your life will be changed. Why? Because you, through the movement of the Holy Spirit loving you enough to convict you, you will come to a place where you will by faith accept Christ as your personal Savior. And we will celebrate. <laughs> I'm praying for you. I'm looking forward to that day when you come up to me or you go to somebody else in the congregation. It doesn't have to be me. And you will say, now is the time. I want Christ in my heart. Everybody, would you just join me with praying for those people this next year? Would you do that? How do we remember? How should we remember? We remember through public testimony. Thank you, Randy. That was a public testimony of celebrating his dad's life. We, we, we remember through prayers of thankfulness. 
We remember through taking communion together, that was what Christ was doing with his best friends the night that he was betrayed. He was remembering and he was worshiping. Communion is not only about just remembrance, but it has an awesome future tilt to it as well. He says, he said, I will not eat this Passover again until. He said, I will not drink from the fruit of the vine until. Until when? Until the kingdom of God comes. With these words, Jesus connects his passion with constant, the constant central theme of his teaching and his ministry, and it's this. The kingdom of God is breaking the power of sin and oppression all over humanity. That's what he was saying. The kingdom of God is breaking the power of sin and oppression over all of, all of humanity. Would you please stand? We're going to take communion together. And if you did not pick up your communion, could I just ask, Dan, would you grab the communion plates? And if you'll just walk down these aisles. And we're going to sing a song so you've got plenty of time to get it from the ushers. So this morning, can I just tell you, this morning, we stand both at the edge of history and the brink of the future, right here. We stand at the edge of 2022 and the brink of 2023. At the same time, we have this awesome privilege of remembering the past and celebrating the view, this panoramic view that God has given us of what is to come. And can I ask you to do something? While we take Holy Communion this morning, can I ask that you spend some time personally looking back at this year? Can I invite you to thank God for answering your prayer this year? Just thank him for the way that he provided. Thank him for the way that he healed. Thank him for the blessings. Some of you had way too much food, and like me. <laughs> God just blessed us with the ability to eat. Can I remind you just how much of a blessing food is? And we had warm houses. Aren't you glad last week we had warm houses? My heart hurt for some of our neighbors here that did not have that. What a blessing. Thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you, Lord, for the new insights that you gave us this last year. Thank you for giving us your word that we could freely study in a in a country that allows us to worship freely. There are some that did not and can't say that this year. Thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness that you provided. Thank you for forgiving us and making us righteous. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, as we stand at the brink of future, some of you will start journeys of great faith this year. I don't know what that looks like yet. I am confident that there are some of you here that God will invite you to take a step of faith in a new ministry that you have no idea how to resource. You don't have the money for it. You don't have the calendar for it. You don't have the knowledge or experience you don't know how God's going to do it. But I'm confident God's going to call some people this year to do some things totally crazy for his glory. 
some of us will have the, have the privilege of speaking words of faith and truth to some people. Perhaps family members or those that live across the fence and we have the privilege of explaining the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I pray God's blessing on you. That God will give you wisdom and perspective. That he'll give you his word at the right moment. And that you will explain Jesus in a way that they will hunger and thirst for righteousness themselves. I pray God's blessing on you. Can I also say that there may be some people in this congregation, this room today, that will not be with us next January 1. Statistics show that 100% of humanity will pass away at some moment. And so there will be some of our congregation that we will gather around a casket and we will celebrate his or her life. And perhaps, I don't know, per perhaps some even in this room today will not just lose someone, but maybe, just maybe, you will not be present next year. My question this morning, as we celebrate what God did in this last year, and now we stand on the brink of what is to come. What is our response to the future? Are we willing to say, God, I, I don't have what it takes. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> this is me talking right now. <laughs> I don't have the resources. I don't have a great enough faith. I don't have wisdom. I don't have the resources, the budget, the calendar. I don't have any of that. But I trust you. That's me talking. I trust God. Why? Because God has already gone before me. And God has already gone before you. I don't know the challenges that you will go through, but I promise you, you will have some very significant challenges. I don't want to be, I don't want to be negative here. I, I just want to be practical. That's what the scripture says, that we will go through trials and tribulations. Our government may say some things that we don't agree with. We may have a, a, a neighbor that, man, she just makes it difficult. But we will go through challenging times. But I can tell you, God has already gone before us. And we can trust him. And as we receive Holy Communion this morning, I would just invite you to take some time as we take communion to just thank Jesus for this last year. And then turn your attention to what is to come. And put your faith in God that he's gone before you and he knows what he's doing. As we take communion today, if you've accepted Christ as your personal savior, you are welcome to take communion this morning. You don't need to be a member. Parents, your children are here. Take this as an opportunity to explain to your children what communion is all about. What a privilege to take it with your family. We will be doing communion just a little bit different this morning. Back in 1995, I had just started pastoring. And I began to prepare our congregation for communion by singing the communion as a responsive song with the congregation. It's words to an old hymn that you all know. Darla's playing it right now. I think you'll immediately know the song. There will be times when I will sing. There will be times that we all will sing. Just follow the instructions on the words. If you'll put the words on the screen, you'll see that sometimes it's all and sometimes it's just me. 
take your communion and we will sing it together. Sing this with me. From all that dwell below the skies, let the Creator's name song through every land and every tongue oh praise him oh praise him alleluia 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 the night that jesus was betrayed he blessed and broke the loaf and said alleluia alleluia this is my body here for you my gift that frees and makes you new oh praise him oh praise him alleluia alleluia Jesus also took the cup after those gathered all had supped. Alleluia, alleluia. This is my lifeblood shed for you, the measure of my love for you. Oh, praise him, oh, praise him. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Do this is said till time shall end in memory of your living friend. Alleluia, alleluia. Meet at my table and record the love of your triumphant Lord. Oh, praise him. Oh, praise him. Alleluia. 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 Oh, risen Christ, ascended Lord, all praise to you. Let earth record. Alleluia, alleluia. You are while endless ages run, creator and with spirit one. Oh, praise him. Oh, praise him. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. With this bread and juice, we both remember our past and celebrate our future. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this last year. 
We thank you for the way that you healed, the way that you forgave, the way that you cleansed and made righteous, the way that you resourced us. You gave us perspective. You walked in front of us. And you walked beside us. And you protected us from behind. You gave us mentors. And you gave us pastors to preach the truth. And you gave us your word that we could freely study. And studied it, we did. Father, you gave us friends. You gave us your Holy Spirit to convict us. To lead us in paths of righteousness. You were our lamb this last year. You were the bread of life, the living water, and you led us to green pastures. Father, thank you for giving us your staff. We thank you that you gave us your helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. You gave us the belt of truth and the sword of the Spirit. Father, we thank you that you gave us the shield of faith and you clad our feet with the gospel of peace because, oh Lord, we were in some battles and you protected us. And we didn't just stay on the defense. We, with the Holy Spirit beside us, went on the offense in Jesus' name. Thank you for teaching us how to pray this last year. Thank you for teaching us some hard lessons this last year. Thank you for taking us through some dark valleys this year because it's through the school of hard knocks that we learned the most. Thank you for our spouses who loved us enough to point their finger and pray for us. Thank you for our children who loved us no matter what. Thank you for the homes that you gave us, the abundant food. Thank you for neighbors. Thank you for jobs. We could go on and on, Father. We're so very, very thankful for this last year. But now, Lord, we are on the brink of a new year. And because we're good humans, we don't know what is to come. But we can guess. We can guess there will be some dark valleys. We can guess that there will be times when we need you to put us in green pastures <laughs> because we need a good Nazarene nap. Father, there will be some times when we need some good food. But more than anything, we need a good friend. Father, there will be some people this next year that will hear the voice of a loving Holy Spirit and they, they will by faith accept you as their personal Savior. Father, our church will need to take some steps of faith and you will need generous people to do that. People who are generous with their time and their prayer life. People who are willing to commit to studying the Word of God people who are willing to give of their first and their best so that your church can expand right here in North Topeka. Father, we want you to know that we trust you with this next year. Whatever we go through, whatever challenges, whatever difficulty, whatever loss, we want you to know that we trust you because you've gone before. And we take our hands off, but yet we open our hands for you to take out of our hands or put into our hands whatever you know to be best. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Would you receive this benediction? Look at me, please. Just receive this benediction as we stand at the brink of a brand new year. May you leave remembering God's story. May there be a fresh wave of celebration that God, through Jesus Christ, paid for your heavy sins upon the cross. And may you sing as the psalmist David did when he wrote, 
I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord for he has been good to me. And now, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace, for he's already come before you. You're dismissed into a brand new year.